microphones, we may as well address that before you're up here later. Okay. All right, here's what I want you, if you can't hear, I want you to make some motion so we can figure that out and fix it. Uh, good afternoon, I'm Diane Martindale, this year's president of the League of Women Voters of the San Juans. The League is pleased to be here and we thank all of those who made it possible. The League of Women Voters does not endorse candidates or political parties, but does encourage informed and active civil engagement. We work to increase understanding of major public policy issues, influence public policy through education and advocacy, and do take stands on issues after study and consensus. Is there anybody here who has not yet had the opportunity to join the League of Women Voters? We've got brochures in the back. We'd love to have She's you join. Got an opportunity. Also, there's a little basket in back. We appreciate small donations as general meetings, and uh, we have upcoming rent for the voter forums. I have some announcements. We have recently co-sponsored a series on climate change with the Madrona Institute and the National Park Service. The last session is this coming Wednesday evening at 7 p.m. at our community theater with a reception at 5 p.m. State Senator Kevin Ranker, who served on the Climate Legislative Executive Work Group over the last year, and Stephanie Soline, Vice President of Climate Solutions and Puget Sound Partnership Leadership Council member, will speak and answer questions. September is Voter Registration Month and heading up our efforts are Lee Sturdivant, Steve Bowman, and Jill Johnson. If you'd like to help with this project, which is brief, please see Lee. Lee, wave your hand so people can see you. There you go. We have our voter forums, mark your calendars, set up on each of the islands. October 6th is Friday Harbor at 5 p.m. at the Grange. October 7th, Orcas, 5 p.m. at the fire station. 7, 8, 9. Sorry. Isn't this what Seven. you gave me this morning? <laughs> okay, October 7th. October 7th, Friday Harbor. October 8th, Orcas. October 9th, Lopez at 5 p.m. at Grace Episcopal Church. The moral of that story is it doesn't even help being married to one of them. To be absolutely right all the time. I know. <clears throat> this is our 20th anniversary of our league, and we will be celebrating at the forums and throughout the year. Are any of our founding mothers with us in the audience today? Oh, what a shame. Okay. Uh, we'd like to thank... Tom Munsey, who tapes our general meetings and makes sure they're posted on YouTube. Thank you, Tom, for your reference and pleasure. I would like to now introduce Sarah Crosby, our hardworking and wonderful programs chair, to guide us through this afternoon's presentations. Thank you. Thank you all for coming out for this rather important meeting, we feel. Um, I do have one additional program note, which is that our November program, educational program, will be, um, we're doing it jointly with the Prevention Coalition here on San Juan Island. And that meeting, to which everyone is invited, will be from 11.30 until 2 p.m. at the <coughs> Presbyterian Church here in Friday Harbor. We encourage people to come and find out about what this valuable resource does for our community, particularly on San Juan Island, but I think we'll have some input from uh, prevention coalitions, some form of those, on other islands as well. Date and? The date again is November 14th, which is a Friday. It is from 11.30 a.m. until 2, lunch is included, in case that will entice you. And it will be at the Presbyterian Church on Upper Spring Street in Friday Harbor. And with that, we'll start our program. According to the Brady Campaign, on average, 32 Americans are murdered with guns every day. On average, 51 people kill themselves with a gun every day. 45 people are shot or killed in an accident with a gun every day. 
medical treatment, criminal justice proceedings, new security measures, and other measures cost U.S. taxpayers in the neighborhood of $100 billion annually. Haven't we had enough? Apparently not, since there has been no significant federal legislation surrounding gun safety, even in the aftermath of Newtown. In Washington State, nearly 6,000 people have been killed with guns in the past decade. In 2009, more people were killed by guns in Washington than died in car accidents. In poll after poll, Americans, including gun owners and members of the NRA, support reasonable uh, gun safety regulations, including background checks. Only those living on the edge of reality think it is possible to remove all guns from the hands of our citizens. Instead, we ask that reasonable measures be put in place to reduce gun violence where feasible. If our federal legislators will not enact sensible gun measures, then we turn to the states. If the state legislators will not act, then the people will. And here in Washington, they have. Enough signatures were gathered to get I-594 on the November ballot this year. The measure seeks to close the gun show and private seller exemptions from required background checks on potential buyers. It is not a perfect law, but it is a start, and it's a statement that all citizens should be able to live their lives without the fear of violence from guns. Signatures were also gathered to put I-591 on the ballot. This initiative, among several points, seeks to stop imp implementation of any statewide legislation until such time as a uniform federal standard is established. With both measures having similar initiative designators and dealing with the same subject, the potential for widespread voter confusion at the ballot box is clear. The League of Women Voters of Washington have endorsed I-594, and therefore, we of the League have a call to action to support it with our voices and efforts of all kinds. In order to do this well, we must understand both measures and be able to speak capably about both of them. Our endorsement is supported by the positions we have on gun safety at both the state and the national levels. While we are therefore not required to discuss I-591, we feel that in um, doing so, we give islanders a more full picture of the difficulty inherent in making laws in general and on this subject in particular. While today's meeting is primarily to educate our membership about the measures, we do welcome the public and encourage everyone to engage in the discussion after the first part of the program. Initially, we're going to show a video produced by a public broadcasting system and entitled, After Newtown, Guns in America. The video gives us a history of guns in this country and explains the differences in the role relegated by people to guns in their lives, dependent on geography, social norms, history, among other criteria. In order for us to advocate well, we must understand why people feel so strongly that any potential restrictions on their right to own guns, excuse me, why they feel strongly about that, that issue. I think this film helps to illustrate that very well. And after the video, Randy Gaylord, our county's prosecuting attorney, will present both initiatives from a legal understanding to make it clear to us what each measure attempts to accomplish. Also in the audience, we have Sergeant Scott Brennan of the Sheriff's Office. Raise your hand, Scott. Can I make it really clear I'm not here as the sheriff's representative. If you want his opinion, you have to ask him personally. That's just a dandy. There we go. Point <laughs> eight. Um, so, Scott will participate in the discussion afterwards as well. As usual, if you have a question of Randy or of Scott, we ask that you omit statement paragraphs and ask your questions succinctly. Thank you again for attending, and if you like our format and would like to participate in the work that we're doing on elections and on issues, please consider joining the League of Women Voters. And with that, I'll start the video.
Guns have been a part of American life ever since the first European explorers landed on our shores. Firearms were here from the earliest days of settlement. Basically, you had to be armed to survive. The gun is just this visceral, powerful symbol. We all have a reaction to it. We're just fascinated by it. From the flintlock to the assault rifle, for over 400 years, these weapons have sustained settlements, promoted trade, and secured our democracy. The Second Amendment exists to protect America from tyranny. I'm not sure that I can think of any neighbors that are around here that aren't gun owners. It's just part of the way we live. Those people that have the guns are those people who are the winners. But all this has come at a cost, because as gun technology has advanced, so have gun deaths. In fact, more Americans have been killed by gunfire in the last 45 years than in all the country's wars combined. I was shot pretty early on. I could only see the flashing and hear the, the booming of the shotgun. Every day on the news, a teenager has been shot. And it makes you wonder, do people really even care? A person with a modern style weapon can now wreak the kind of havoc that a, a platoon of soldiers used to achieve. The history of the American gun is as complex as the history of the American people. And in the aftermath of mass shootings in places like Newtown and Aurora, Tucson and Columbine, the question of how America came to be a country that often seems to live and die by the gun has taken on a new urgency. Once you fire the shot, you cannot call that bullet back. Many gun owners, myself included, uh, want a common sense gun law. This is not an ordinary piece of property. Its lethality must be respected. The gun isn't the catalyst. The violence is the catalyst. It's a debate as old as the nation. America's relationship with the gun began 500 years ago in places like this. And to this day, few value the wilderness more than the country's 13 million hunters. Their ranks grow each year, and so does their impact. Anywhere you go in rural areas during hunting season or before hunting season, uh, you'll see how much the hunt, how much hunting is in the fabric of the culture of these rural areas. Stephen Williams is president of an organization that supports wildlife conservation. He was formerly George W. Bush's director of fish and wildlife. He's also a hunter, and he complains that no one ever talks about the benefits of this part of America's gun culture. For example, the taxes collected on gun sales have funded decades of wildlife conservation. In 1937, Congress passed an excise tax on firearms and ammunition at the manufacturer's level. You have to pay 11% tax on those products. It's a considerable amount of money. The last few years, it's about 350 million to uh, up to 400 million. Couple that with the money that hunters pay for a license or a permit, and we have well over a billion dollars a year Guns are a major contributor, and hunters are the major contributor to conservation in the United States. Like most Americans, I believe the Second Amendment guarantees an individual right to bear arms for hunting, or sport, or protection, or collection. It is a competing view of guns that divides the country, a wound that won't heal, and one that's reopened every time there's another mass shooting. Every time the, the nation suffers one of these gun violence tragedies. Most hunters cringe a little bit because in some, some media outlets, you know, portray it as, as guns are bad. If you, therefore, if you own a gun, you're a bad person. People that live in urban areas view guns differently than you do. We use them in much different manners. They're not used for crime. They're used for enjoyment.
It's part of our culture. It's part of our quality of life. The gun in Steve Williams' rural Pennsylvania plays a very different role than in large sections of urban America. You can't legally buy a gun in the city of Chicago. There are no gun stores, no gun shows, but the city holds the title Murder Capital of America. Look into my eyes. On May 10, 2007, we were driving to school, and I remember telling Blair, you know, do good. I always told him that every day, I love you, and he said, I love you too. So I um, dropped them off, and I went about my day. For five years, Annette Nance Holt has returned to an empty house. Approximately 3.15 this afternoon, a CTA bus was traveling eastbound on 103rd Street. The bus stopped at 103rd and Halston. At least five people were shot. In 2007, Annette's son, Blair Holt, was killed on a Chicago City bus. The bus's security camera caught the incident on tape. Blair was struck when the gunman unloaded his 40 caliber semi-automatic, but missed his intended target, a rival gang member. Blair died shielding a classmate from the gunfire. He was one of 448 people murdered in Chicago that year. Since then, gun violence has increased. Father Michael Flager is Annette's priest. He consoled her after her son's death. His church, St. Sabina, has a memorial to the dozens of children in the community who fell victim to gun violence. There's nothing to me more tragic and more horrific than standing over a casket of a child that we as adults are supposed to protect. There's something wrong with a society where children are being killed. This boy was a good student. He helped out so many people. We did everything possibly that we could to make sure Blair was safe because we knew what was out here in the streets. It was just impossible for that to happen to Blair. How do guns just flow into certain communities? It's not accidental. There's no place in America now where gun violence is not touching. Violence had affected Blair long before it took his life. An aspiring musician, he often wrote and recorded lyrics about the impact of guns. When I die, I won't cry. It shouldn't hurt to die alone. I see ghosts, demons, and demons. Their powers are streaming, streaming, and they won't stop till my mother's grieving. I don't think you can possibly keep your child safe in the city of Chicago. It's someone else's child that's going to take your child's life. This prevalence of guns in American culture is not new. It's part of our identity, one forged in the colonial era. Well, this is a smoothbore musket, and was used in the colonies, the American colonies, from about, oh, early 1700s to about 1820 or 30. It was pretty much state of the art. It has a lock, the stock, and the barrel and what happens is that when you squeeze the trigger, the cock scrapes the uh, sparks into the pan and ignites the main charge that's in the barrel. America was founded on, on the firearm for whatever you feel about it. And a lot of people regard it as a, as a symbol, much like the American Eagle. This was a primary arm of the American Revolution. So this is the, the British Brown Bess. It's a standard issue British military gun throughout the 18th century. Very typical of the European muskets used during that era. It's a muzzle loader, flintlock, smooth bore. 
This gun, being a smoothbore musket, uh, would be reasonably accurate up to about 75 yards or so. Guns have been here since Columbus. They've always been part and parcel of American life, and they were critical for survival. Don Troiani is a painter and a collector of historic weapons. He says the large number of guns available in those early days was mainly due to the sheer distances between the colonies and the mother countries. The first guns, of course, were all imported from Europe. But gradually, you know, they started doing repair work on them here because you can't send it back to Europe. They would make the parts, and gunsmiths emigrated from Europe. Uh, they were capable of making lots of guns, and there were lots of gunsmiths. This was something new and a departure from life in the old world. In Europe, generally just the wealthier people would own guns for hunting around their estates and so forth. Uh, there were not a lot of guns floating around. You know, in America, it's a different situation. Basically, wherever you are, there's a potential danger, either coming from the sea or coming from the borders. You had to be armed to survive. The colonists encountered threats in all directions, from the Native Americans, the French, and the Spanish. By the end of the First Indian War in 1676, half the towns in Puritan New England had been destroyed, and one-tenth of all men of military age had been killed. Those threats were met when well-armed colonists organized themselves into citizen militias under the command of the colonial government. In Massachusetts, before the revolution, everyone was required to own a musket and a sword or a bayonet. It was the law, and you, every able-bodied man was in the militia. The militia were not always reliable in battle. Sometimes they were, sometimes they weren't. It depended on the situation and how they were led. As the revolution against Great Britain drew closer, and particularly following the massacre of unarmed colonists in Boston in 1770, many of those militiamen began to turn against the English. The decisive moment came on April 19, 1775, when a column of British Army regulars advanced on the Massachusetts towns of Lexington and Concord. Their mission, confiscate the colonists' hidden stores of guns and ammunition. Beginning with the shot heard round the world, the war that followed saw the defeat of what was then the best armed and best trained army in the world. And it secured the gun's place in the story of America and in the Bill of Rights. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. That has been enshrined in our history, and it's been enshrined in the Second Amendment to the Constitution, which specifically, of course, refers to the militia when talking about the right to bear arms. Roger Lane of Haverford College says that it was another revolution, a technological one which would change America's personal relationship with the gun. We can date very precisely the point at which American homicide rates began to take off. February 25th, 1836, is when Samuel Colt patented the revolver. This is a Colt percussion revolver. This model's a Dragoon. It was introduced in the 1840s. It's a six-shot, 44 caliber, and it's a very effective repeater. Uh, simply the hammer is cocked and the trigger is pulled to fire uh, the first round and then each successive round. In 1836, a Connecticut businessman named Samuel Colt patented a revolver that could be mass-produced. This handgun could fire six shots without reloading. The revolver is relatively cheap, it's portable, and very important, it's concealable. And the homicide rate in eastern cities began to soar in the 1840s and 50s as a result of the availability of these new Colt revolvers and their imitators. The rise in violent crime was quickly overshadowed by civil war a war which transformed the firearms industry. Mass production took off, 
and weapons became more lethal. In the space of four years, some 600,000 Union and Confederate troops perished. At the war's end, the demobilized Union and Confederate troops were permitted to keep their firearms. Suddenly, a country with a few hundred thousand guns became one with millions, introducing a new phase of gun violence. Civil War puts a lot of guns into circulation. And uh, that establishes a, a kind of base for the, um, for the modern culture of personal weapons in the United States. What follows the Civil War is a period uh, of about 50 or 60 years in which the history of the United States is marked by extremes of social violence. Professor Richard Slotkin of Wesleyan University says guns were the key to how the West was won. Native Americans were decimated. In the South, guns enforced Jim Crow and white supremacy. And in the North, labor riots and unrest led to mayhem in the streets. No gun is more identified with this time period than the Winchester repeating rifle. This is the Winchester Model 1866. Introduced in that year, it was the first Winchester lever action rifles that came to be so heavily associated with the American West. This gun could effectively fire 17 rounds as fast as you could work the lever and pull the trigger. Put all of that together with the availability of relatively cheap, efficient, useful handguns, and you have a recipe for why Americans bought and gun manufacturers made large numbers of weapons. And it's that period that, that sets the base for the United States, that, uh, that we're a country in which self-defense weapons are widely distributed and, and understood to be socially necessary. Frontier six-shooter, the peacemaker, the quintessential sidearm of the American West. You want to know who used this revolver? It's probably easier to ask who didn't use this revolver. It was favored by lawmen. It was favored by outlaws. It was favored by working cowboys who needed a big, rugged, durable revolver that would fire reliably when you needed it to. The guns may have been everywhere, but apart from former soldiers, few people were skilled in their use. In 1871, a group of Civil War veterans created an organization to train civilians in the effective use of firearms. It was called the National Rifle Association. The NRA was formed largely as a sportsman's association. It was about proper use of weapons, uh, rifles in particular. They held contests. They taught people how to use them. They taught people how to use them safely. They encouraged hunting. David Keene is the president of the National Rifle Association. Well, the impetus uh, really came from a group of Union generals, and they had felt that the Civil War lasted a bit longer than it might have uh, because the recruits that the Union had in the North couldn't hit very much. And they were facing Confederate soldiers who had grown up in the country, who'd been here for some generations, uh, and were pretty good shots. And the interesting thing is that, in some ways, it's the same divide that we have in a political sense today. While the NRA was improving America's aim, lawmakers were regulating guns across the rapidly industrializing country. But there were always exceptions that allowed citizens to shoot first and ask questions later. It's a uniquely American defense that today we call stand your ground. There's always been a code in the United States that permits interpersonal violence under certain circumstances, justifiable homicide. Killing in a heat of passion can be justifiable. Killing uh, an armed person in self-defense. Uh, honor killings uh, are uh, given a kind of license in American culture. It's called the true man defense. If you're a true man, which is to say an honest man, either on your home ground or pursuing your lawful business, and you're menaced with deadly force, you are permitted, not required, but permitted to defend yourself with deadly force. You do not have an obligation to retreat. 
Meanwhile, deadly force was becoming deadlier. The Thompson submachine gun, of course, has been known as the Tommy gun, the Chicago typewriter, or the gun that made the 20s roar. The Tommy gun found a home on the streets of America just in time for prohibition, according to author Daniel Okrent. When the 18th Amendment was enacted, its proponents thought that this was going to bring heaven on earth because it was going to rid American society of the terrible plague of alcohol and alcoholism. And of course, what it did it was it brought a different kind of hell on earth in the amount of crime involved. There was so much money to be made providing people with something that they wanted, liquor, uh, that it became uh, the nexus of a huge, huge criminal industry. Fabulous farce. World War One is over, and so are America's days of legal alcoholic drink. There was violent crime almost from the beginning, but on a large scale, not until around 1924, when there was a rift in Chicago between two different uh, portions of one gang. But there was a three-year period. There were about 250 gangland killings, uh, and you can presume that almost all of those were through gun violence. Voters were upset by the fact that they were in the city of Chicago alone during the 1920s, 400 plus gangland slayings, none of them solved, culminating in the famous St. Valentine's Day massacre in 1929, in which probably it was never solved. Associates of Al Capone gunned down with a Tommy gun, seven members or sympathizers of the North End gang. And once again, politicians sought to control the new wave of guns with new regulations, but this time on a national scale. Some time ago, and I'll be glad to fire it off for you. And that culminated in the first national legislation, the Gun Control Act of 1934, banning what they called gangster weapons. This national legislation would mark the first governmental response to urban violence across the country. It was quickly followed by the establishment of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A special agent must be a good marksman and have the courage to shoot it out with the most venomous of public enemies. Supported by the new gun control laws, legions of heavily armed G-men took on the gangster subculture. One of the most enduring legacies of Prohibition was the creation of the National Crime Syndicate, which happened only because of Prohibition and the need for people to have, for, for mobsters to have allies in other cities and to divide up territories. Obviously, the gun remains a uh, critical element in the continuing operation of uh, criminal enterprise. But in 1941, combating a bigger enemy became the national priority. The Second World War led to unprecedented innovation and production as factories were converted to support the war effort and weapons and ammunition were churned out around the clock. Millions of American troops quickly got accustomed to their rifles and wanted their own when the war ended. Throughout American history, the soldiers come back from war. They want to be able to shoot a civilian version of the rifle that they carried. And this has been continuous uh, throughout all American conflicts. And the rifle serves basically the same function in the military or in civilian uses. It only makes sense that the military borrows the civilian advancements and the civilian market uh, borrows the military advancements. And just as in prior wars, when World War II was over, many of those guns found their way into civilian hands. Throughout the 1950s and 60s, Americans acquired millions of firearms. At the same time, guns were also finding their way on screens large and small, in television and movies. It was the age of the Western, where guns and gunmen were often the stars. We celebrate violence. We make heroes out of stone killers like Jesse James and Billy the Kid and Butch Cassidy and Sundance. We see them as rugged individualists who refuse to be pushed around. But the era known as the New Frontier was brought to an end by a surplus 1940 Italian-made rifle purchased by mail order for 1995 by one Lee Harvey Oswald. In a warehouse, a sniper with a rifle poised waits. 
The cheers of the crowd almost muffle the three shots. The assassin's aim is deadly. The JFK assassination ushered in the most turbulent era in recent American history. As issues of race and class tore at the fabric of society, the Black Panthers and others turned to guns and the Second Amendment for protection, according to the former chair of the Black Panther Party, Elaine Brown. We believe we had the right of self-defense against an occupying army, as we saw it, of police. So we decided that we weren't going to play the native people who tried to fight fairly with uh, combat. Uh, we decided that the only way we could defend ourselves with, this, with the same weapons that were being used against us. In early 1967, the Black Panthers organized armed patrols through the poorest neighborhoods of Oakland, California, an act that some call the beginning of the modern gun rights movement. At the time, California law permitted citizens to carry loaded weapons so long as they were visible. When the state legislature took up a bill to prohibit individuals from carrying loaded weapons, the Panthers, heavily armed, entered the state capitol to demonstrate for their right to bear arms. We went to the legislature to protest the gun law that was being debated at the time. And uh, we felt that um, if there was a right to bear arms under the Second Amendment, then we should have a right to bear arms. And that violence and the gun ultimately were used to keep us enslaved and keep us oppressed, then the only logical response to that is to talk about self-defense. And uh, we believed and uh, felt that it was, incre it was important for us as, as a people to recognize that if we were ever to be free, we may have to engage in a, in a struggle that would become violent. The Panthers were disarmed when then-Governor Ronald Reagan signed a new state gun control law. The U.S. Congress followed suit by passing the 1968 Gun Control Act. The legislation denied weapons to felons, minors, and the mentally ill. This new effort to regulate guns was bipartisan. Even the Nixon White House called for new regulations. But an old player with a new focus was now on the scene. The anti-gun movement, if you will, uh, was ecstatic at that time. They thought they were on a roll. What they didn't realize was that they had managed to wake up uh, gun owners, uh, sportsmen, hunters, and the like in this country in a way that they hadn't had to be wakened before. The National Rifle Association had shifted its 100-year-old priorities from hunting and conservation to gun rights. We had to take this fight because there was nobody else in the country that could do it. And that was the emergence of what some call the new NRA, the NRA that's, that's seen very visibly as the champion of the Second Amendment. I think the leadership of the NRA back then was already realizing that the great strength that they had was these were people who would vote on the firearms issue if they felt their rights were being threatened. And that's what, from then until today, has given the NRA the so-called political clout that, uh, that we have. But the NRA didn't have that clout just yet. Gun crimes continued to plague the country, and the guns were growing more sophisticated and more lethal. Over the next decade, the national homicide rate reached record levels. Police confronted increasing firepower on the streets. We were outgunned by the uh, uh, criminal elements. We had what they call a 38 special, and and I remember my partner shooting a guy in a defensive situation where he fired through the windshield of a car. Uh, the, the bullet hit his coat and fell on his lap. Uh, it, they had no penetrating power. Frank Serpico joined the New York Police Department in 1959. He retired in 1972 after serving as a plainclothes officer on vice and racketeering details at a time when New York was plagued by violent crime. Later, Serpico made headlines testifying about police corruption. February 1st, 1971, I was shot point blank uh, by a drug dealer, and I still have the bullet in my head. I was in the process of making a buy in a violent neighborhood. I hit the door, there was a, a chain lock. I snapped the chain and uh, I had my hand and my arm inside the door. I had the perpetrator covered. Uh, when I turned back, he fired and I returned fire and uh, he left a blood trail where they were able to find him at his next location. 
the first thought that went through my mind was, this is it? I was fortunate enough to, to survive. From cops to presidents to celebrities, no one, it seemed, was immune from gun violence. There was a significant injury of the uh, major vessels inside the chest, which caused a massive amount of blood loss, which probably resulted in his death. I applied for a license to own a handgun. In the 1960s, Bill Cosby carried a gun in the TV series I Spy. But by the 1980s, he was a father living in a busy city, worried about his wife and kids. And I bought this pistols about this big, and uh, I went through the necessary exam. When I talked with the officer who took me over to the range to uh, practice firing, he said to me, once you fire the shot, you cannot call that bullet back. And that, that was strong for me. There's no oops to this. Cosby says he eventually sold the gun and donated the money to charity. But a decade later, a gun would come back into his life with devastating consequences. His 27-year-old son, Ennis, was shot and killed in a freeway robbery. A bullet is meant to enter and open up organs, flesh, and come out making a hole this size in a human being. Do you really want to do that? Do you really want that out there? Firepower became the hallmark of the drug wars raging in America's streets during the 1980s and 90s. As a federal agent and as the police commissioner in New York City, Howard Safer saw the rise in drugs and guns firsthand. I think the real violence really started in the 80s with the crack epidemic. We started seeing guns in almost every arrest. We saw nine millimeters that fire 14 to 17 shots at a time to uh, the extreme uh, street sweepers, which is a shotgun that has a hundred round magazine on it. It's amazing the amount of firepower. During Safer's tenure, the New York Police Department reduced major crime by a third and cut homicide nearly in half. And they did it by going after the guns carried by the drug dealers. 80% of the crime in this country has a nexus to drugs. If you deal with drug trafficking, you reduce not only crime, but you reduce violence to a great extent. So we put together street crime units that were plainclothes units that's primary purpose was to go out, identify people with guns and arrest them. And we saw a huge reduction in violence and we started hearing on our wiretaps that we had with criminals that, you know, don't carry your guns because street crime's out there and they're gonna lock you up. By this time, a rifle that first saw use in Vietnam was gaining popularity. It was a civilian version of the Army M16, part of a class of guns known as AR pattern rifles. It's best known as the AR-15. These guns are popular because they are accurate, they are reliable, they are adaptable, they are the guns that are being used to win target competitions with. They're a rifle that is technologically accessible to everybody. They're just the, the most popular rifle out there. They will also fire just as fast as you can pull the trigger. Like all semi-automatic weapons, they can be easily, if not legally, converted to fire multiple rounds either as bursts or in a single stream. A person with a modern style weapon can now wreak the kind of havoc that a, a platoon uh, of soldiers used to achieve. 
That firepower was the key reason Congress passed and President Clinton signed an assault weapons ban in 1994. But the ban didn't cover the millions of weapons already on the market, and it was allowed to expire after just 10 years. The Obama administration is proposing a new ban over the objections of the NRA and gun enthusiasts. The people who would ban the so-called assault weapon like to characterize it as the president himself has, as a, uh, a gun built only for the battlefield, to spray bullets, as he puts it, and to kill people. It's designed only to kill people. In fact, it's just like the shotgun that I take duck hunting. It's just like the semi-automatic rifles. I understand why people want to talk about banning high-capacity uh, firearms. But I can tell you that there's, there's a lot of folks that own those guns in this country um, that use them for recreational shooting in a safe manner on a, on a range. I don't believe they, they present any, uh, any problem to you know, public safety nationally. Banning assault weapons by itself will not solve the problem. Most of the guns that, commit, that are used to commit crime on the streets of our city here, as well as cities across the country, are really your semi-automatic handguns. Philadelphia Police Commissioner Charles Ramsey, a veteran of the Chicago and Washington, D.C. police departments, thinks the ban is a good place to start. I think that's a solid step, because why do you need certain types of weapons? They, they serve no civilian purpose. Shooters, want your magazines, your field 12 and 12, stand in front of your target, palms up, palms down. To train for the increased firepower on the street, New cadets at the police academy in northeast Philadelphia drill for unexpected close combat situations. We work everything here on muscle memory. Everything's repetitive. They'll do it for 60 to 80 rounds now, and then they'll come back. Yeah, if, if they don't get it, we'll come back and do it again. Before joining the force, three quarters of the recruits had never fired a gun. At the end of three weeks of intensive range work, they'll have shot more than 3,000 rounds. Our homicide rate's gone down when you compare it to 2007, a year prior to my arrival. But when you look at the last three years, we've been slowly increasing in terms of homicide. I'm very concerned that the officers and the types of weapons that we carry often put us at a disadvantage when it comes to dealing with, with criminals. I go to a lot of crime scenes, and I can't tell you the last time I visited a crime scene, a homicide or a serious shooting, where we only found one shell casing at the scene. You're always finding multiple shell casings, sometimes 30, 40 shell casings. And obviously, if you're struck several times, uh, the odds of, of you surviving are, are not that good. Like the rest of the country, many of the violent crimes in Philadelphia involve illegal guns. The Philadelphia Police Department has confiscated thousands of every imaginable type. We need to really be serious about going after the people who are illegally using guns and imposing very, very stiff sentences for people that use guns to commit crime. There is a significant number of people who will use a handgun illegally. Not the majority, but a significant number. And we can impact that number of people if we, if we make it so that they have to hesitate and think about whether or not they want to carry a gun illegally or use a gun uh, to commit a crime. Despite the reduction in gun crime across the country over the past 15 years, Howard Safer says there's still a glaring loophole in the gun laws. 99.9% .9 of guns used in crime are obtained legally. When I say obtained legally, they're bought by either a citizen who can pass a background check and are stolen or diverted, or they're bought by straw purchasers. And what I mean by straw purchasers is that somebody who does not have a criminal record is approached by criminals and paid money to go buy guns and they get them legally and then they give them to the criminals. And these days, gun shows are where most of those guns are bought. No event represents America's gun culture better than the gun show. Over 5,000 shows are held around the country every year. Attendance is at record levels. Inside the gun show, you can uh, participate in the politics of guns. You can participate in your beliefs. You can uh, hear over the PA system uh, who to vote for. Joan Burbick wrote the book on gun shows. It's called Gun Show Nation. She's also a gun owner. 
She says the sales pitch at a typical gun show is part politics, part history, and part patriotism. A typical show will have 30, perhaps to 50 display tables with cowboy shooting guns and also historical guns that are just on display. The core of the show often is handguns that are higher calibers and also the military style weapons. And she says the other part of the sales pitch is fear. The gun manufacturers have figured out ways to create markets for weapons for civilians. They're constantly uh, telling you that your life is threatened unless you purchase a gun. But guns are pitched to me that I will not be safe on my person or in my home unless I have a weapon. And so then basically they're selling you on the relation of fear. And possibly the greatest fear driving the gun debate today, mass shootings. While mass shootings also happen in other countries, the tragedies happen here much more often. Sixty mass shootings since 1982, 25 of those since 2006, seven in 2012 alone. I remember the, the flashing starting from from the front right of the theater uh, when the gunman entered and started firing. It was very methodical. There was a fire every single second. Uh, you know, just the assault rifle, shooting, shooting, shooting. And I wondered, you know, is he gonna run out of ammo? Uh, is he gonna walk up and down the aisles and, you know, execute me and my friends? In July 2012, Stephen Barton and a classmate were in the middle of a cross-country bicycle trip when they stopped in Aurora, Colorado. They decided to take in a midnight film on July 20th. I think I realized maybe at the last possible moment what was going on because I brought my right arm up and that was basically in the same instant I was shot. I had shotgun pellets in my neck, uh, my face, my chest. Uh, I still have eight in me. Um, and, uh, you know, I just remember being shocked at what had happened, you know, kind of incredulous, not, not even believing it was happening, even though there was blood, you know, spilling out of my neck. But on another level, you know, I knew exactly what was going on. My mind went to Columbine, to Tucson, to Virginia Tech, to all these other horrible headline-grabbing shootings that, you know, you think about, but unless you're directly affected by them, you think, you know, that'll never happen to me. Stephen Barton was one of 70 people who were shot in the theater. 12 were killed. After the shooting, Barton returned to his parents' home in Southbury, Connecticut. Their home is just east of Newtown, site of another mass shooting. I grew up seven miles from, from the elementary school uh, where, where the shooting took place in, in Newtown, and I know that community really well. Since Aurora, uh, there have been several mass shootings. I mean, none is as bad as Newtown, but, you know, every time I've noticed these mass shootings take place, it's a lot easier for me to, to understand how horrible that experience probably was. It's basically like a war zone where, where you feel like you're being hunted down, and um, I just, I understand that feeling more than I ever wanted to. In the aftermath of the Newtown shooting, gun sales have skyrocketed, propelled by citizens determined to protect themselves and by the prospect of new gun control measures that could sharply curtail the supply of weapons. It's the latest clash between the right to bear arms and the need to feel safe, according to Fordham Law Professor Saul Cornell. The decision to own a gun is a decision to use it. Any successful gun policy must deal with legitimate concerns about self-defense. I mean, there are ways of doing that in a responsible way and there are ways of doing that in a non-responsible way. If you're going to draw that gun, you better be good at it. So get yourself ready, okay? In New York's Nassau County, F6 Laboratories is using high-tech simulations to train police and civilians in responsible gun use by preparing them for unexpected encounters with guns. Eric Blumenkrantz is one of the owners. 
we can do a scenario where, you know, you, you open your eyes because you hear glass breaking, and now can you shoot, can't you shoot? Their simulator was developed in Germany a decade ago. It's now used by 200 European police departments, but this is the only American location. Personal weapons and live ammunition are used in all simulations. The computer precisely records every shot and conjures up countless scenarios, from the mundane to the terrifying. Like this home invasion. Does the guy have a gun? Does he have a knife? Does he even not have a weapon? I actually believe this is how anybody who has a gun permit should be trained. We have this sort of Clint Eastwood, Jason Bourne fantasy, where we think that you give anyone a gun and suddenly they can take out uh, anyone in a stressful situation. Nice you can make these scenarios as live and real as, as, as anything you could imagine. Alex, you ready in there? This is a man who believes in what he's selling. He and his partners also run a nonprofit foundation that subsidizes some of the cost for local law enforcement to train here. In New York State, you go and you get a license and you buy a gun, and there's no requirement for any education whatsoever. You get a driver's test before you, you know, you drive a car before you get a driver's license. Um, so I, I think we need to change the paradigm. In Austin, Texas, technology is changing the paradigm to a point that may make traditional gun regulation all but impossible. If Cody Wilson gets his way, people will make their own weapons in the privacy of their homes. There's lots of different ways to do 3D printing. Our project is trying to take as many of those technologies as possible that we have access to um, and create functional gun components in those parts. Wilson is using three-dimensional printers to make weapons components out of high-grade plastic. A self-proclaimed crypto-anarchist and law student, he designs and distributes plans for gun components for the AR-15 rifle, the same gun used in recent mass shootings. The dangerous dimension of this project, I think, is obvious, and also there are probably unintended dangers that we can't even expect. But I think for the most part right now they've been overplayed. These plastic components are fully functional, every bit as lethal as their store-bought counterparts. They can be made by anyone with a computer and access to a 3D printer. Wilson plans to distribute the weapon designs freely via the Internet. The ability to do bad things scares people. Of course bad things can be done, and I'm not trying to sound dismissive of that. But we also see the extremely positive dimension of this, which is a, which is a liberalization of the act of sovereignty, the practices of sovereignty themselves. But people don't want to hear that. When we printed this magazine off, the world could have been born again. I mean, I get nothing but constant emails about people excited about this technology specifically so they can evade what they see as this just burgeoning regulatory regime. I mean, we're sick of it. This is something that at such a granular level cannot be regulated. Wilson's activities are being monitored by federal agencies, but his vision of a world without effective gun controls may already be a reality. In America's cities like Chicago, the flood of illegal guns is claiming hundreds of lives each year. 75% of all homicide victims here in 2012 were African American or Latino. It may be the only city where you must wear a badge to legally carry a firearm, but illegal guns are easy to find. It's not difficult to find a weapon. You know, people are constantly selling guns there, or you ran out of guns sometimes. Eddie Bocanegra grew up in Chicago's South Lawndale neighborhood. He knows just how easy weapons are to find. And this pretty much is a dividing line. This, is, this divides pretty much two communities as well, North Lawndale, South Lawndale. You know, if you're involved in the street or if you're not, you know, you know somebody who has a gun. Either your dad has a gun under their, under their mattress or, you know, in the closet or in the cabinet. Violence in many ways is about, it follows the laws of physics, right? So when there's an action, there's an opposite, an equal reaction. 
What do you think the connection is in this country between guns and trauma? Just Elena Quintana is a Chicago psychologist specializing in violence prevention. She's seen dozens of young men killed or sent away for gun crimes at an early age. For many of them, guns are a rite of passage. I was 14, involved in the gangs, and then at 18, I went to prison uh, for something that uh, I'm not proud of saying or, or that I take still very, I'm very shameful, but I did 14 years for, for taking someone's life as a result of, you know, being involved in the street gangs. You'll see young people, 10, 11, 12-year-old kids would be actively readying themselves, kind of armoring themselves for life on the street and life as a warrior and life in battle. It wasn't my plan to take someone's life, but it was my plan to inflict pain on this person the same way that they inflicted pain on my friend. Dr. Quintana says the wounds caused by these street guns are the signposts for young lives thrown away in a predictable cycle of violence. The data from the mid-90s stated that the first time you get shot, on average, you'd get shot again nine months later. Uh, on average, you get shot nine months after that. The third time, you would die. But even here, in neighborhoods plagued by the gun, there is hope. Eddie now works to prevent those caught in the web of violence from following his path. But the truth of the matter is that sometimes, you know, guns pulling the trigger is almost as turning off the light switch in your house. It's just as easy as doing that, right? It's the aftermath that you're left to think about. The aftermath of Newtown has everyone thinking on all sides of the issue. Because at its core, the debate about guns is more than a debate over what to do about them. It's a debate about our national identity. Why should the four million people who legitimately own, use, and enjoy the AR-15 be demonized or penalized because two or three people use it illegitimately? There is something that can be done, and I get frustrated when absolutely nothing happens, as if status quo is going to be the answer, as if Sandy Hook is the last time we're going to have to deal with a school shooting, and I guarantee you it's not. People say, you know, is it too late to curb gun violence? And, and I would say no, and I hope we don't ever take that approach, that it's too late, there's nothing we can do. The bottom line here is, if we're going to prevent these kind of violent incidents in the future, we all have to come together, both gun advocates and people who don't want any guns on the street, and reach some common goal. Reach some responsibility where you can have your weapon, but you have to be responsible for it. We have to find a way to stop diverting weapons to criminals. And until we do that, there's going to be more of these. In order to do something about violence, you're going to have to accept, as Dr. King himself said, and as the Black Panther Party said, you have to have fundamental change. The sad reality is that we can't prevent all these tragedies, but there are ways that we can decrease the everyday gun violence within families or, you know, on the streets of our cities. There are ways we can decrease that violence. Um, my invitation was to come and talk to you about two initiatives that are going to be on the ballot in November. And um, some early newspaper stories about them have shown that they are conflicting with each other. And so we'll talk about the extent to which they conflict with each other, what they're about, and, um, and uh, I'll answer any questions that you have. 
these are initiatives about um, the background checks to be done as a method of gun control. And the object is to test the background of people or not, depending upon the circumstances of the initiative. Um, and use that as the method of assuring that guns get into hands of people that they should belong to and not in the hands of people who should not have them. And it's a way of reducing who has access to guns in an effort to make uh, use of the guns uh, appropriate. Now, um, I grew up around guns. I'll just give some personal bias and, and approach to start with. Uh, and it's important because it's why these two initiatives are in Washington State right now. My, my background reflects um, the state of Washington and two different aspects of the state of Washington. And why you're going to see a lot of money coming into the campaigns for these two initiatives this year. And it's because of the cascade uh, divide. And it's because we have a state with two vastly different um, cultures. The Eastern Washington culture and the Western Washington culture. And the Western Washington culture today is a very urbanized culture and the Eastern Washington culture is a very rural culture. And so as the film described, you have different viewpoints about guns uh, in these different cultures. Um, my dad is 87 and he grew up uh, in a rural area and taught all of his boys, there are seven of us, um, about how to use guns. And we did it by um, taking guns, practice target shooting at guns at a young age, uh, hunting together, uh, walking and uh, disengaging guns, um, knowing and, and learning such things as, oh, you always unload a gun before you cross a fence, things like that. Uh, always, always keep the gun pointed away. You never put a loaded gun in an automobile um, when you're out hunting and things like that. And, you know, I use small guns, uh, always long rifles, they are uh, shotguns, usually 20 gauge, rarely 12 gauge because it hurt more when you shot it. Um, and occasionally long rifles up to size 30 out 6, deer hunting guns, okay. Um, and, and my dad today is an advocate of hunting, fishing, he has a bumper sticker on his car. It says gun control means using two hands. And uh, he. It, it, we, we kind of kid him about it, and he um, kids us about it as well. But he, he doesn't, he, and, and it bothers him when he sees what happens with um, assault rifles and uh, the tragedies that you see. That's not the kind of gun he knows or recognizes, and it's nothing that I've been trained in. And so you have this, this shift in types of guns and so on. Um, and. You know, I got to say that there, he he would he would probably oppose any uh, kind of gun control regulation because he would believe that the way he raised his boys is the way that you should obtain gun control. That is to have good, responsible parents who teach people how to use guns and how to use them responsibly. But the problem is, even with best intentions, problems can occur because of the guns go into hands of people who are felons, people have criminal history, people have a propensity to commit crime. Uh, people who are mentally ill uh, or people who have not don't have that same level of upbringing um, and as parents we know that that is something that just happens and so um, it has uh, occurred and since uh, at least since the Brady times of the Brady bill and back some many uh, decades now that there has been some sort of gun registration process uh, first on the national level and also on the state level. And, um, and so what um, the, the existing state and federal laws require that um, some background check occur. Uh, in Washington, um, we do background checks to make sure that Ill illegal felons don't have guns, um, people convicted of certain misdemeanors uh, involving uh, domestic violence and so on people who have restraining orders against them to, to keep guns away or so on. Uh, people have been found uh, guilty of crimes by reason of insanity uh, or not mentally competent. But, you know, there are a lot of people on the spectrum here who are not necessarily found uh, insane or haven't been convicted of a crime involving insanity or use that defense or, um, uh, and so on. Um, and, um, and so in Washington State, we, we do require some background checks. Federal law also has some background check requirements as well. Um, 
uh, potential buyers of firearms. The federal requirements apply when the seller is a firearms dealer only, and um, it applies to all types of firearms, whereas the Washington law only applies to pistols. The federal law does not require a background check if the buyer has a concealed pistol license. So you have a lot of people running around getting kind of uniform pistol licenses to avoid that. And there are no um, um, background checks required for casual sales, sales between individuals, um, and so on. So there are two, so let me turn now to the two competing measures. Um, and by the way, I, I didn't bring handouts because I think the best place to read about these measures is in the online voting guide or the, or the voting guide, the vo voter's guide, which will be issued within a month. Um, and you can find them online. Uh, the, the voter's guide includes that section that's written by the um, Attorney General on it's a neutral statement of law as well as the pro and con statements and, and who is supporting this. Uh, I, my suggestion is to read the voter's guide rather than, of course, listening to the advertisements because the advertisements are not going to tell the full story. Okay, one, one measure, uh, it's initiative 591. It's this long. Okay, very, very short. Short sentences, uh, uh, and it is what I would call the defensive measure. I think, from what I read in newspaper stories, it actually was promoted or, or thought of or decided to be used in Washington State after the longer measure was, uh, excuse me, the longer measure, complete text is about eight pages long, after this measure had been aired. And, um, and it was a counter to it. And it, does create some confusion that is well recognized at this time. Um, but it's a very simple measure. And Section 1 says that uh, it is unlawful for any government agency to confiscate guns or other firearms from citizens without due process. Unlawful for government agencies to confiscate guns or other firearms from citizens without due process. And um, Section 2 says it's a new section. It says it's unlawful for any government agency to require background checks. Remember, this is all about background checks, probably, uh, on the recipient of the firearm unless a uniform standard is required. So it says Washington State can't do its own thing. You have to wait till a uniform standard is done on the national level, and then we would follow the national uniform standard for background checks. Does it say national or federal? But you national standard is required. <coughs> Uniform national standard is required. So um, this is kind of a defensive measure. Is 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 it's viewed as a defensive measure. It gets approved. It should block other um, statewide measures. Um, at least that's what some believe. Now there is a statewide measure underway right now, um, and that is Initiative 594. Um, this. Initiative 594 um, would, uh, let's see, the best way to read it is um, the, yeah. Um, uh, the, the ballot title as written by the Attorney General. Yes, excuse me. What's the number on that short one? 591. 591, excuse me. 591 and 594. Um, and by the way, the numbering goes in based upon when they're received by the Secretary of State's office, not uh, by when they're sent out for signatures or, or signature gathers or are active. So, um, so if 591 was a response to 594... Why doesn't they have a later number? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's because the sequence in which they are filed with the Secretary of State's office determines um, what the number is and they file them when the signatures are received. So one took longer to get signatures, or one held back to do it, to submit it later in the process, which is just a strategic measure. The numbers usually don't matter too much, and, and, and really don't matter here. Uh, what the Secretary, what the uh, Attorney General has said is this, about 594. Uh, this measure would apply currently used criminal and public safety background checks by licensed dealers to all firearm sales and transfers, including gun shows and online sales with specific exceptions. So what it does is it takes the, uh, what 
what it does is it takes the, what the law does is it takes the uh, current um, system in Washington State for requiring background checks and applies it not only to um, firearms dealers, but it also applies it to those gun show sales and private transfers. And includes other things besides pistols. It includes pistols and uh, all firearms. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, um, and the way it does this essentially is by making gun dealers an escrow agent for all sales. Those are my words. Okay? But if you're used to the escrow process, you know that you have to go to somebody else to help facilitate a sale. And essentially, gun dealers are going to help facilitate sales between private individuals so that a background check can be done before the transaction is completed. It does that by applying not only to sales of guns, but also to transfers. So they add the definition of transfers into the current law, uh, redefine the word sale, and then require everyone to use this new process, whether it's a casual transfer or an organized sale by a dealer. Think of it as an escrow. You're not going to be able to just sell the gun to your friend who comes over to your house or that you meet or whomever. You're going to have to run it through somebody who does the background check. You'll check the, the buyer of the gun to make sure that they're eligible and don't have any criteria that makes them ineligible. Okay, how does that... So, the way they do it, and the reason that this law is a little um, longer than, than the other... The reason it's longer than others, it takes about eight pages, is because it amends the current law, changes the existing system, to enlarge it, to include a, a bigger uh, variety of transfers. Now, and by inserting this word transfer in addition to sales, right, that's a key word in the new law, transfers in addition to sales. Okay, so, yes? Can I ask if the transfers is partly to deal with the straw buyer system? Like yes, yes. You, you saw the straw buyer right. system and, and the transfers intended to deal with that exact situation uh, as well as many others. Now, you would say to yourself, wow, if you define transfers broadly like this law does, um, uh, transfer is defined to mean the intended delivery of a firearm to another person without consideration of payment or promise of payment, including but not limited to gifts and loans. Gifts and loans. Oh, shoot. You know, think Can of I my dad handing yeah, right. me a gun uh, to shoot. My, I last shot a gun with my dad um, last <laughs> September, last July. I go to visit him in Salt Lake City. He's in Utah. Uh, um, and uh, where, you know, um, in Utah, you know, uh, mm -hmm. talk about the culture being different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just before hunting, the day before hunting season opens, you know, it's a school holiday mm -hmm. in Utah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, Friday before hunting season, deer hunting season begins, it's a school holiday to make sure all the kids can go with their dads and their parents to the um, rural sites to go hunting. Um, but transfer includes uh, gifts and loans. Now, I was thinking to myself, shoot, I don't have a gun in Utah. What gun am I going to shoot when we go trap shooting? He likes to shoot trap. I like to shoot trap, too. Uh, and uh, he shoots just about as well as I do, notwithstanding the fact that he's 30 years older than I am. And um, uh, so he loans me his gun, mm -hmm. right? Is, does that fall within the definition? The way it reads, yes, unless there's an exception. So there are a group of exceptions. And people have sat down and said, we think we've got all the exceptions put together that we need. So let me go through to tell you what some of those exceptions are. Uh, exceptions to the background check would not be required uh, for a firearm that is a gift between family members. Uh, it would not apply to the sale of antique firearms. How far out does a family member go? Uh, let's see, I have, that's a good question. I, 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 I'll that's a very good question. <laughs> Family member, if I can ask, answer it real quick, I'll say what the law says. 
Uh, well, it's <laughs> the usual as defined in another law. Uh -huh. uh, it's used in 1099-020, so that's, I can't answer it specifically for you. I'm sorry. Um, okay, family members. Uh, antique weapons, like that flint lock gun that they showed at the, at the beginning, that is not covered. Um, it would not apply to um, temporary transfers needed to prevent imminent death or great bodily harm. So if you quickly grab somebody else's gun and used it to protect yourself, you can do that. If you throw somebody else another gun and say, help save me here, you can do that without concern of being um, uh, violating this law. Um, Randy? Yes. But in a theoretical sense, if you, you don't have a gun, you borrowed a, friend, a, a gun from a friend to go off and shoot with your dad on the weekend. That would be a violation it of the would law. Be. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because that wouldn't be a family member. I would have borrowed it from a friend just to go shoot with uh, my dad. Yeah. The chances of your being caught at that would only be if you did harm to somebody and somehow law enforcement came in on or it. Or right? you, you, you had a, a tail light in your car and the gun visible and the there's a question about what. What are the penalties there involved? Is that. Uh, the penalties are the first time you violate the law, it's a uh, gross misdemeanor. Gross misdemeanor's maximum penalty is um, one year in jail and $5,000 fine. And the second time you break the law, it's a felony. Mm -hmm. It's a low level felony. Um, so it's a, a progressive uh, law. Okay, so some other exceptions. Let me. Keep going through the exceptions. Um, others that require, um, not require background check. Temporary transfers between spouses. Temporary, allow a spouse to use it. Temporary transfers for use at a shooting range or in a competition or in a performance. So my dad carries the gun to the shooting range and then we both shoot trapped together. That's allowed. Um, a temporary transfer to a person under 18 uh, for education, sport or education. So when my dad takes me out and I'm 16 years old, he teaches me not to, uh, to unload the weapon once we cross the fence and he allows me to take a gun, that's fine. Or if I bring along my friend and my dad allows my uh, friend, who's unrelated to him, to use the gun for the same person. When they're 18, uh, that exception goes away. It's only for young people. Um, uh, a person who inherits a firearm, other than a pistol, uh, upon the death of the former owner would not be required to go through the background check. Inheritance will be a way around this, but not for pistols. All pistols go through the escrow. Okay, go through the escrow of the, of the licensed agencies. Um, so, uh, what else is there to say? Oh, there are a lot of time limits and such um, under the existing laws with respect to pistols. Um, uh, let's see. Are there any money things? Financial implications? Yes, for the state to well, have come up with new what, departments or for what gun the, owners uh, to pay? The Office of Financial Management um, estimates that it will cost some money, about a million dollars over the next five years at the Department of Licensing because they're going to have to manage this. Mm -hmm. um, undoubtedly it will cost individuals money because this escrow um, service won't be free. Yeah. So the transfer of guns will cost money. And in fact they anticipate that by saying there is no tax on that charge, but um, still if, I, I have no idea what the what the going price is going to be for these kind of transfers, um, and the assumption is that firearm dealers will charge a fee for administrative costs of facilitating the background check, perhaps even holding the gun, whatever. I think a real organized system will develop in Washington State in response to this. People will be able to transfer guns. They'll learn how to do that quickly or as quickly as possible, uh, notwithstanding the waiting times. Um, so, uh, pistol sales don't change. 
Um, and uh, that's, that's how I see that the measures, the two measures will work. Um, if they both get adopted, uh, early polling shows that both were highly popular among voters. More recent polling has showed that 591 is um, starting to fade in its popularity. The first one, the very short one. Um, and there is sustained support for 594. There's big money coming into 594 from all um, different places. There's, it, but it's, it's, it's early to tell until people read the fine print and decide how they feel about these registration requirements. Um, I know that Scott wanted to talk uh, and have, did, Scott, did you want to say anything? I don't know. Am I allowed to get up and speak? <laughs> well, this, um, I don't, I don't, I don't my, mine is more opinion. And so right. Scott is here thought. as a member of the public I rather see. than okay. representing the sheriff's okay. office. And so he's here um, as a private citizen and can speak about his own opinion and experience, but you may not. Sorry. Yeah. Okay, so let, let me let me just then go but through. There are I'll, numerous questions here. I'll, yes, I'll I'll be sure to answer every question that I can. Let's start over here. What do you see as the pros and cons to 594? Well, um, as 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 a prosecutor, I see the pros as being um, uh, a way of you're going to hopefully keep weapons out of the hands of some people would otherwise get them. Okay? So there will be some people who, it will be so hard to get a gun, they won't use a gun. Um, uh, I, I also think that one of the cons is people will find a way around it really easily or just disregard it. And particularly if they're going to do harm, uh, they think the chance of them getting caught with a gun will be quite limited. Um, the pros and cons, I, I really, I haven't studied it well enough to, to, to draw a, a strong, firm conclusion um, about that. Uh, at first I was very, um, I think the cons are that it will have um, big opposition among the rural element of the communities. And that's, that's it. Guns have to be the same kind of conflict that this the film show exists in Washington. And um, I think that if anyone feels that they're going to be limited in the way that what they can do with their guns in the field by handing them to others and sharing them and so on, they'll see it as well. I think that one of the pros is I think they thought through a lot of this quite well in terms of the exceptions. Um, I think it's a little complicated to understand if you fall within the exception easily in the kind of circumstances where you're likely to hand a gun to somebody on a temporary. I think those temporary transfers may need to be tweaked a little later um, if this gets adopted uh, and the legislature would have the ability to do that. Uh, one of the pros, I, I, I'm not a fan generally of initiatives. Okay, I think that I prefer to see things hammered out in the legislative process. But I do favor initiatives when the legislature is unable to act on a topic. And I think this is a topic that legislature legislators are fearful of acting on. And so it does take initiative by the public to get something moving. Um, so um, I know I haven't necessarily answered the pros and cons of how, how it will work. I think if, we, if, if a, a, an efficient escrow system is developed, that's a, um, you know, it's the same way we transfer property and do other things, we will become very accustomed to that. Those people who use guns will, will find a way to make that happen. Here. Yes. So um, just lock it into uh, gun show scenarios like um, this um, um, background check, like could, would it be automatic or would it be like they'll have to mail the item to the person or? I, I think if there's a 10 day waiting period. So you um, might buy it at the... So you might buy it at the gun show and it'll take time for the background check to occur. Mm -hmm. yeah, you'll be able to see them at the gun show, handle them, test them. You can put your name on it, you can put your money down on it. Um, but the transfer won't happen until the, the background check goes through. What happens if both initiatives are adopted yes. and they cancel each other? And yes. One purports to amend the statute right. and the other purports to do away with it. Yes, yes. Who wins? Um, uh, the uh, I don't have an opinion other than what Hugh Spitzer, a noted um, constitutional 
uh, lawyer and scholar has said, and he says, we haven't crossed that bridge in Washington State yet. We don't know exactly what's going to happen. He believes that the um, Supreme Court would be persuaded by one of the measures that received more votes than the other. Um, the, the objective is to, uh, in construing legislation, is to try to give meaning to every word and every phrase. But I think that I agree with uh, uh, Mr. Spitzer and I think there are irreconcilable conflicts between this, these two laws and if they get adopted at the same time, uh, our usual rules that we have for that just simply don't apply. We have some rules that apply when the legislature adopts one law during a session and then another law without reference to it. Um, but I'm not sure that those rules will really be useful where the public does that in the initiative process. Mm -hmm. So um, we we'll just have to wait until. You know, all I can do is speculate at this point. Yes? Back to 591. I didn't understand that first provision. Can you give some kind of down home example about when a gun is confiscated without yeah. due process? Yeah. You know, um, I tried to think about where that provision would really be helpful. We already have provisions in our Constitution that prohibit confiscation of property without due process. We go get a warrant if we want to seize property. We get a warrant if we want to search for it. Um, there are certain warrant exceptions. Um, and so uh, they're useful and from time to time, and we know what those are, and they're recognized as exceptions to the due process rule. Um, so uh, I don't know what this does to add to that. Okay, it's a statutory. To me, it's simply a statutory um, confirmation of something that the state constitution and the U.S. Constitution already require. Yes, please. I guess it, it goes back to the, I guess that same question, that first phrase in, in 591 is it's whether it somehow sets aside the exceptions, I, guess, I suppose, because guns are probably confiscated if they're used I, I don't the, think it, it sets aside, aside any, uh, creates any exception to the warrant requirement. Or anything. And then the second question may be whether you can answer, because I guess it goes to intent, but it seems to me, as you say, it just sort of restates what already is. But it's the kind of thing that sounds so good that people would vote for the measure because of that when the real purpose of the measure is the second I won't depend yeah. on that. <laughs> there, have been, there have been some who have written about it to that extent, in, um, and I've read that in newspaper stories, mm -hmm. um, that, very, uh, that very thought. Yes, another question in, in front. Um, the NRA, where do they come down on, on either one of these? Um, uh, wait, I just have to look. I, I they're funneling money into 591. Okay, they're funneling money into 591. And, and um, from what I've heard is the NRA does not oppose generally um, uh, background checks, generally. But uh, I, I don't think they support 591. Oh, do you have another question? Yeah, I have another question about um, one of the statistics was 99% of the guns that are used were legitimately background checked and legitimately owned. Mm -hmm. They may have been stolen or otherwise, you know, but it's like, really? I'm sorry, I can't help on that. That's, that just surprises me that it's possible Scott could weigh in on that as part of the law enforcement community. The, the, amount of, the amount of guns that exist, and a lot of people don't understand it, they're out there. Um, one, of, one of the rifles my dad left me was a .30-06 from 1926. It has a serial number, but it's never been registered anywhere. So, you know, if it gets sold to someone or legitimately or moved around, there's, there's no tracking of it. But the people who decide to commit a crime steal them. Um, I, I, I won't call the, the person on the East Coast killed his own mother to steal her guns. 
the person down in California with his Greek um, problem with women stabbed all of his own friends to death to get their guns. Um, so it. So this my, 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 my little pitch today was that all of this money and effort should be focused towards mental health because, as an officer, I know that this is reasonably an unenforceable an unenforceable law. The Washington Council of Police and Sheriffs is against it, not because we want bad guys to have guns, but because it's unenforceable and they're funneling millions into it. Saturday I sat down with the paper and the headline is that they're letting the crazy people go because we don't have enough money to keep them anywhere. At the same time they're spending five million dollars on a gun control bill and it, as someone who has been dealing with our, our mental ill here, that's just very frustrating. May I respond to that for just a second? Yeah. I mean, I, I think the idea that you want to put money into mental health um, uh, facilities is terrific. But $5 million is peanuts on this campaign. And I think the larger good is showing people that they actually can have an effect on their future. And people are losing faith that their government is acting on their behalf. We haven't been able to get the federal government to do anything. We haven't been able to get the state government to do anything. So if the people, by putting an initiative on the ballot, whether 591 or 594 wins, there will be legislation that, that the people have brought about since we simply haven't gotten action from anybody else. And I think that's a large good that comes from this whole process. Personally, I mean, this is a discussion. <laughs> okay, let's go around the room and ask questions, and then we'll come back to those who've already asked. Absolutely. In the back, well, I'm Laura. Some, and I'm sort of supporting what uh, Steve has said because Scott, got the, Scott. The, the, Scott I'm sorry, hey. close, close enough. Um, <laughs> the instances that have happened in the school district where I school districts where I have worked, all all of them. They, they took the gun away from a parent, sometimes from a locked closet or something, or in one case took the gun away from a law enforcement officer. Hmm. And I don't know what the solution is to that. Um, I also have a question about firing weapons on San Juan Island or in the county. Yeah. Um, I know that there are a lot of um, amateur uh, shooting ranges on the island. Um, they're located in gravel pits or up against the side of the hill. And I complained about that because someone was out shooting until after dark one night. And I thought, well, maybe I'd like to have that stopped. And I also wonder how good a shot this person is. Laura Jo, could you ask your question? All right, my question is, is there, a, I was told when I called the sheriff that, I, that um, if it was happening on private property, there was no law regarding firing weapons, even if it was a you know in a situation that was potentially dangerous or annoying or different. What's what's the situation? Uh, we don't have uh, specific rules concerning the uh, firing of firearms on private property. There are that said, there are some limitations. That is, during hunting season, uh, long rifles cannot be used for hunting purposes, you must use what's known as the slug method in a shotgun. Um, and that's a matter of state uh, wildlife protection regulations, also because we are a community where we have houses um, relatively closely, you know, on five-acre lots and so on, where uh, it's the distance of, of, of a big, powerful uh, mm -hmm. Fast four um, projectile can go, so we try to shorten the distance that the projectile can go. But that's not what you're asking about. You're asking about shooting at a range on a private property. Now, this law does speak to that by saying that the transfer or loan or use of a gun that's not yours at one of those locations is not exempt. Those shooting ranges must be licensed and approved by the local government agency, not an informal shooting range. So we have, for example, the gun club on Orcas Island, which is a formally approved mm -hmm. um, location 
but gravel pits and those kind of places are not places where somebody could loan or share a gun without uh, running afoul of this law. Scott? So, current Sheriff's Department policy is if you hear shooting and you want to report it, we will go check it. Even if we know it's somebody that has a range with a safe backstop, we're going to go make sure that it's not kids, it's not somebody that's got a can of beer out there with them. Our way to control it is reckless endangerment. If your range is not safe, you're committing reckless endangerment, which is a serious crime. If you're drinking while you're shooting, it's reckless endangerment, it's a serious crime. Um, and we go, there's a couple of guys who shoot pretty regularly, and you know, I may go check their range once a month. I don't know all by first name, but we're still going to go check it every time for you just to be sure. If the range is not safe, we shut it down immediately. Um, no safe backstop, too small of a neighborhood, and items like that. Shooting after dark is reckless endangerment. You can't see if somebody's walking out of the range or not. But the noise ordinance specifically exempts firearms. And so that's what frustrates so many people. <laughs> 20 hours or so. <laughs> okay, let's go back around. Uh, well, Tom had his hand up and he hasn't been called on. Oh, Tom. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, can I make a comment that's not specifically on 591 or 594 now? It looks like we're well, sort of we open really season. Sticking to I-591 and 594. You're going to get back to the general questions later, though, right? Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, this is for you, Randy, and law enforcement. Yes. I mean, one of the greatest horrors is seeing these mass shootings. So what do you see? that would prevent those? And if, if it's about mental health, be real specific about what needs to happen. Well, I subscribe to the theory that uh, there isn't a need ever for these kind of multi-shot uh, weapons to be available. I think it's the size of the magazine and mm -hmm. the ability to shoot quickly that is the real harm. And I would, I think, some way to um, address that would, is something I'd be favor of. Um, but I, I don't know how to go about it in a, in a lawful way. <coughs> My statement in the film about how these guns are popular because they're so accurate and um, uh, easy to, to use it bothers me because I just don't see why anybody needs a magazine. Mm -hmm. um, I, I grew up where you had to put a, you know, in a shotgun you have to put a, a plug in to make sure that you can't put too many um, shells in and shoot at too many ducks at one time. Um, I think it's five, isn't it? Maximum three, actually. Three in plus. Washington. Yeah. It's three plus the one in the chamber. No, right. Two, three. Two, two in the bag, one in the chamber. Two two yeah, so it's yeah, five is probably the capability of most guns, and you can only shoot three at a time. Um, something that could, would restrict how 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 many um, shots could ever be fired from a single gun would be useful. But it doesn't stop somebody from coming with multiple guns all uh, uh, lined up, um, ready to go. Um, certainly, early detection parent involvement is crucial to preventing mass shootings at schools. Um, and, um, you know, I, I think that as a society, I don't understand why we have mass shootings or mass destruction, whether it's bombs at the um, running races or in, in the Boston Marathon or um, use of, of big guns uh, like in the Aurora Theater. Um, it, it just, it's senseless. It's, uh, I can't make sense of it. And because of that, I, I have a difficult time establishing policy to uh, prevent it. What about our law enforcement? <sighs> okay. Um, I, I've been doing a lot of research on this, and um, one of the ones that stood out to me was a um, colleague professor who's a criminologist who said that mass shootings have not increased in the last 20 years, if you look at it as a year-by-year -year thing. What has increased is the press hammering at you 24 hours a day telling a guy's life story, making it popular for troubled people to try it. In Canada, they, they, did, they don't do that. Um, they had a recent mass shooting there. Basically, they said, a really pitiful person killed these people. Here's how you can donate and help them. And that's the end of it. 
We're not going to talk about him. We're not going to put his life story on TV. We're not going to talk to his friends and family. We're not going to cram him down his throat 24 hours a day. Everybody knows that kid that says, I'm going to run away and get your attention. Most of these mass shooters are, I want to get your attention. This is how I'll do it. And I'll be in the news. I'd like to comment. Go ahead. Um, so uh, Canada also has another gun law restriction. So that also yes, um, that also cuts down on the, the number of um, uh, mass shooting incidents. And um, it has also been argued that um, what has caused the mass shootings is our increasingly frenetic pace of life and that mentally unstable people become overwhelmed with Absolutely. everything coming at them. And uh, if you read the book, Prepared for a Purpose, written by the woman who was the secretary of the Georgia school that talked the shooter that came into that school down, no one was in, injured, no shots were fired. That was her thrust, was that her approach was to just keep him calm and to calm him down as he got more agitated. So, um, you know, I, I would argue that uh, we all need to calm down. <laughs> okay, in the back, in the blue shirt. Actually, I, one, one quick point here, and like, like Sarah and I, we had, what, what we ended up talking almost three hours. Yeah. And. I, I guess if you looked at us on a spectrum, we're di diametrically opposed, and we had a really great conversation. I enjoyed it immensely. So, what um, our prosecutor was talking about guns and fire many shots. When we had flintlocks, they had what was referred to as a brace of pistols. You put on a coat that would carry six or seven guns. They only had a single shot. Um, during the Civil War, the cavalry guys would carry six to eight revolvers on them at any given time. So. You know, picking a gun and saying that's the bad gun that caused it, once again, is diverting so much attention and money and time away from trying to affect the one better the society that's creating it. Um, we had to talk, when my father went to school, he would either take his 22 or his 12-gauge shotgun and leave it in the, in the coat locker, because on the way home, he was expected to try and get something for dinner. This was during the Depression. <laughs> and they never ever thought about shooting each other over over you know the problem at school, and it was not unusual to walk home with a couple of friends with rifles. So you know, I'm I'm not. You guys are all great-hearted and want to really do something useful, and I'm just saying as someone who's been on the front line with all of these people, that a lot of stuff's getting diverted away by focusing on the wrong item. That's just my little tip. Well, that sounds like a, a challenge that could be taken up after 594 gets passed. Yes. <laughs> They're two different issues. Um, right. We've got okay. time for another question, question and, and Tom's Sarah, comment. Steve has a I want to keep... Oh, and Steve has a yeah. Steve, go ahead. The reference was made in the film about AR-15s, and I think they referred to it in, at one point as a sporting gun, uh, or a force sporting uh, loose definition. So I was curious. It's a gun out of 100. Do you Hi. shoot a deer or do you shoot a duck with an AR-15? No, I think by sport they mean competition, shooting competition. People do hunt deer with AR-15s. I don't, but I know people who do. Okay. How sporting? Okay. Yeah. Doesn't seem so sporting. Oh, no, 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 no. Um, let me just, just say, we have to be out of this room at 2 o'clock, so if we can ask more questions if we can get people to help us put the chairs away. <laughs> Another five minutes of questions, and then maybe everybody can help just a little sure. bit. Sure. Tim has a question. Can I go right around one more time? Okay. Tim. These are two legal questions. You said that if someone has a taillight out, and in the pullover there's evidence of a firearm, can the officer investigate that this law has been complied with? That was your example. Second question is public records requests. All these new registrations and who has uh, licenses and carry good, are there exemptions to that? Or can news and the public find out who has the guns, who has sold them, and have a website and put it all up? Do they put car licenses in? Um, yeah, they 
As to your first question, uh, yes, if an officer sees a, a weapon, he can ask whether or not he can have been complied with the law in order to look for that gun. Who's, he can ask whose gun it is. And, um, he may not necessarily get the, there's not a requirement that you carry your compliance with you at all times, some kind of certificate or anything. Once again, if it's one of those guns Grandpa gave you his 22 rifle and you're carrying it legally in the car, but there, there's no record of it. You know, like we run the serial numbers and make a model, it will only show us it hasn't been stolen. So we don't know if it came from Grandpa or anything like that. So um, just no way to trace it. State registry of transfers. There's simply a requirement that you comply with this law when making a transfer. Uh, 